Welcome to our second uh, colloquium of the, of the semester at the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. Um, we are delighted to be featuring uh, Professor Arash Abizada from uh, McGill University. But as, as I usually do, I want to be sure you know that we have a fantastic reception to follow with wine and beer and all kinds of edibles. So if you feel a stomach growling, just be patient. So what we usually do is we have a presentation uh, followed by a Q and A, an active Q and A. So be sure to get your questions ready. So let me just say a few words by way of introduction. We're delighted to have um, Arash Abizada here. Um, he specializes, as you note, as we noted on the uh, flyer, in contemporary political theory, political philosophy, and the history of philosophy. And um, he has um, he's written several very important articles on uh, in democratic theory, on borders and immigration, on cosmopolitanism and solidarity, and uh, especially also um, some work on Hobbes and Rousseau. And in fact, he has two books on Hobbes. Um, one uh, is um, The Oscillations of Thomas Hobbes Between Insight and the Will. Who is the publisher? That one is on my hard drive. It's not published. <laughs> That's just on my hard drive. No one, no one. Uh... <laughs> oh, what about the Hobbes and the Two Faces of Ethics? That's that one got off That's... my hard drive into the publisher's hands. Right. Yes. When was that published? That was in 2018. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so hopefully uh, you'll see that you should encourage him to publish because everything is very well developed. This is an amazing um, paper on agential power and structural power, causal and non-causal. So we're delighted to have you visiting down here in our great city. And um, welcome. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Carol, uh, for inviting me. Thank you to the Center for hosting me and thank you for uh, coming out, uh, whether in person or on Zoom uh, to the presentation. So as I understand it, I should speak for a maximum of 40 minutes. Is that right? So maybe at the 30 minute mark, someone could give me a, if I'm still speaking, if you could sort of give me a, a, a kind of reminder that I'm, yeah, yes. I wanted to just say, I wanted to uh, make sure to credit the uh, political theory uh, colloquium. Um, Tyler here is one of the leaders of that organization, and he'll, he'll monitor that. And I also want to thank Patricia and Vance for you know, a very well organized um, session from our center. Okay, so I'll start by maybe giving you a bit of context. I know that some of you have perhaps read the paper, and many of you have not read the paper. So um, I'm going to go through the paper with you. Uh, trying to highlight the structure of it. But before I get into the paper, I thought I would motivate it and just give you a sense of where I'm coming from, why I wrote this, and you know what, what got me into this stuff. I've been working on a series of uh, pieces on power recently. This is kind of where I, I, I dug myself into this hole, and I can't seem to get out of it. But this is, uh, this is where I'm at right now. And part of what motivates this project is uh, my work in democratic theory, actually, where I'm interested in, I think of democratic theory in terms of the, uh, a commitment, a normative commitment to uh, political agency and political equality. And political agency, I think, has to do in part with participation, but in part with power. And so does political equality. For me, part of what political equality involves in democratic theory is equal political power and decision making. And so then the question is, well, what is this thing that's supposed to be equalized? Um, and in particular, I think it is partly agential power. So I'm interested in what agential power is, but I'm also interested in the larger phenomenon of power uh, because I do think that it uh, if when thinking about other issues, for example, moral responsibility, when thinking about justice and the distribution of power in a society, that we can't just think about agential power, but also have to think about structural power. And so that's kind of where uh, this paper comes in. It's my attempt to try and delineate what I think the conceptual background to a lot of normative theory that draws on notions of power uh, might be. Okay, so that's this is my attempt to articulate it. So it's not strictly a normative paper. It's a conceptual paper, but for me, it's very much linked to normative concerns that I have in political philosophy. Um, and of course, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of also put it in context uh, in terms of the center, in the global context, we are, uh, of course, many in many cases, we're concerned with the effects that are produced by many hands. So 
Uh, how is it that you can think about responsibility in contexts where outcomes are the result of the exercise of power by many different people, none of whose actions are necessarily decisive or necessary for the outcome to actually occur? How can you assign moral responsibility in these kinds of cases? Um, and uh, when it's, first of all, hard to trace causal responsibility, but also um, uh, uh, it's hard to articulate what the causal responsibility is supposed to be in the first place in these problem, in these cases of many hands. So, um, and furthermore, uh, in the global context, we're of course also uh, concerned very much with the nature of structures. And so again, I think the notion of structural power is uh, a key concept that we have to conceptually clarify for ourselves uh, when doing normative theory, whether in the domestic or in the global context. So, um, also by way of background, let me just sort of lay out what I think is some of the, maybe kind of motivated in another way now, is that I think that, um, uh, first of all, my topic is the social power of intentional agents understood as intentional agents. So I'm leaving aside a sort of metaphysical conception of powers, like the powers of the causal powers of entities and so on. It's very much concerned with the fact that we are intentional agents with intentional states and that we act through our intentional agency. Um, and the standard kind of to set up the background for the paper, I think a standard kind of liberal view about the nature of power is that it always operates by way of actors' intentional uh, actions uh, and also always by way of causing outcomes. And so, uh, so for example, you know, very famously, uh, uh, Brian Barry distinguishes between power and luck. Okay, and the thought here is that, you know, just because you benefit from uh, things without having exercised any intentional agency in producing those outcomes, well, that's not a matter of power. For example, it might just be a matter of, of luck. Um, and therefore, I think on this kind of standard view, in order for something to be considered to be the effect of somebody's uh, wielding of power, uh, that it has to satisfy at least two tests. One is what we can think of as the intentional action test. And the second is the causation test. So the intentional action test says that an outcome arises uh, by way of the agent's intentional actions, that the intentional actions play a role in somehow uh, the, uh, the outcome arising. And then this causation test is that the role that it must play is a causal role. It causes the outcome. That's sort of the thought here. So you put these two together. Um, and it's clear, however, that this can't be sufficient in the case that I'm concerned with, which is the case of um, the power of intentional agents understood as the power of intentional agents. Um, because sometimes we, there's many cases where uh, you have, for example, you may cause actions by way of your, you may cause outcomes by way of your intentional actions, um, but they're entirely unwelcome to you. So, you know, it could just be, I mean, there's an example that uh, is in the literature on power uh, the example of somebody who, for example, in a dark, dark alley is walking there and there, there's someone else who asks them for money and they pull out their wallet to give alms. And then, of course, the fact that they pulled out their wallet alerts the mugger that this person has money on them. And so they get mugged. So their actions, their intentional actions play a causal role in the outcome. They help to cause their own mugging. But of course, we wouldn't think of this as an exercise of their power, for example, over the mugger or, or anybody else around them. Um, to affect that outcome. So uh, that suggests that something, which is a third test, which is what I call in the paper, the welcome test, which is somehow that the outcome fulfills the agent's preferences, intentions, objectives, or plans. And you can see again, that this is all linked to the into agent's intentional states in some way. And that's what distinguishes power in our sense, the sense that I'm concerned with, that is at stake in the notion of social power and the power in that other metaphysical sense. Um, that I think is somewhat distinct because the welcome test plays no role in that other uh, con concept. Um, however, so I'm giving you that background, that sort of what I, you know, loosely calling the, the liberal background, if you like. Um, and uh, there are various familiar phenomena that seem to speak against those assumptions. In other words, that when you wield power, when you have power, that it operates always by way of uh, satisfying the intentional action test and the causation test. So uh, the examples that I give in the paper, um, which I'll go through a little bit more in detail, are, for example, a mafia godfather who actually is able to get the, you know, get his 
preferences and objectives all satisfied without having to lift a finger. And why? It's because he's got a bunch of henchmen who work for him and they kind of, you know, they kind of know what his aims are and they're doing it for him. And in fact, that's a tremendous amount of power. He doesn't even have to do anything. That's kind of intuition here that it's not by way of the agent's intentional actions. Or um, another example that uh, I give, and you can also see it on the ha handout, is the charismatic prophet. You know, she's so charismatic that people are just sort of tripping over themselves, uh, trying to satisfy her every wish, even before she's aware of those wishes in, in, in a way, right? Because they just love pleasing her. You know, she's just so charismatic. They just want to please her however they might be able to. Uh, sort of less goofy examples, if you like, uh, men in patriarchal societies, uh, just by virtue of standing in a particular position, occupying a particular position in the social structure, in this case, the gender structure of society, uh, they may be able to have their preferences and intentions, objectives uh, fulfilled without, not by way of their intentional actions, for example. Um, another uh, obvious you know, parallel one would be whites in, in the racial hierarchies of Europe or European settler societies. So all of these different examples, the reason why they seem to resonate with the core notion of the power of agents as intentional agents, I take it as because that core notion is uh, the capacity to realize what one wants. And so that's not, that I'm not putting it in a technical way, but I think that's just kind of the core intuitive, if you like, idea. And that's, that's what the welcome test is meant to track. That's what it's meant to articulate in a more rigorous fashion. So, but these are cases in which the welcome test are, is met without necessarily the intentional action or the causation tests being met. And so the question is, when these other two tests fail, but the welcome test is met, can it sometimes be the case that we can attribute this to the power uh, of the agent in the sense that we're concerned with? And the, one of the theses of the paper is that the answer to that question is yes, in some contexts it can be. So I'll just outline three overarching theses to keep track of uh, in the paper. First, the one that I just said, which is that there is such a thing as a power which does not operate by way of intentional actions. That's the first one. Uh, there's another uh, uh, set of categories of power that operates but is not causal. The agent doesn't cause the outcomes, but nevertheless, we can speak about their wielding power in those cases. Um, and finally, even in the case where you wield causal power, um, it could be that you do so without being decisive for the outcome, without making a difference as to whether the outcome occurs or not. So those are the three um, uh, theses that you might want to keep track of while I uh, go through the paper. So the agenda then is, first of all, I want to divide uh, the concept of power as I'm in the, in the, in the sense that I'm interested in, the, the power of intentional agents, qua intentional agents, into two categories. First is agential power, of agents, and second is what in the paper I call elicitory power, of which I'm concerned with uh, with a sort of species of that, which is structural power. So I'm going to just I'm basically going to talk about structural power. So if you keep track of those, so agential power of agents is where you effect outcomes by way of your intentional actions, and I'm going to try and argue that this comes both in causal and non-causal forms. And then secondly, structural power of agents. This is where you passively elicit the outcomes not by way of your intentional actions. And it's structural because not only is it passive in this way, but also it's because you have this power in virtue of the position that you occupy in the social structure. So that's what I mean by this. Uh, people use structural power, that term, in other ways. So that's why it's important to be clear about what I mean by this. I don't mean, for example, the power of structural structures. I don't mean any kind of power that you have just in virtue of occupying a position in the social structure. I mean, the power that you have in virtue of occupying the social structure, and that you uh, um, wield, but not by way of your intentional actions. So it's passive or elicitory. Okay, so that's the agenda. So let's get to the uh, analysis. Um, so, and the argument for why I think it's this case. Now, methodologically, the way that I proceed is I proceed through a series of examples that are meant to be illustrate paradig paradigmatic instances of what uh, that are supposed to instantiate the core idea of power, the capacity to get what you want. Um, and uh, intuitively, they're meant to uh, resonate with your considered judgment about these cases. I'm not going to, I'm not relying on your intuit, your linguistic intuitions about the terms of art that I'm using, because that would be cheating, right? And that, that doesn't get you anywhere. So I'm relying on these cases. Um, okay, so 
Uh, the first case that you see on your handout, here I'm talking about agential causal power, and it's meant to give you an analysis of what agential causal power is. So the first one is the unique assassin. This is somebody who is the only person who is in the position to be able to assassinate the victim. No one else could possibly do this, and that they go ahead and they carry it out, and so they kill the victim. Okay, and uh, this may turn you off. It turns off a lot of people to talk about assassination cases, particularly people who aren't used to these kind of uh, things in analytical philosophy. I'm sorry about that, but they're meant to sort of elicit strong intuitions about these things. Um, so, uh, but it's not meant to say that the exercise of power is inherently power over. It's not meant to say that the exercise of power is inherently evil. Uh, although, you know, you might think that these are cases that instantiate both of those properties, but it's not supposed to be a generalized. Um, so the unique assassin uh, is someone whose action in killing the agent, uh, in killing the victim, was both necessary for the outcome, but for their action, it wouldn't have happened. And it's sufficient. They don't need anybody else to act. They don't need to work with anybody. They can just do it on their own. That's why they're the unique assassin. And it's necessary in a robust way because um, no one else could have possibly done it. So you don't need robust necessity to have power to affect outcomes in this causal way. You can have, that's what the lone assassin is supposed to show. Lone, lone assassin is somebody who is one amongst many people who could have killed the victim, but that, that's the only one who acts and does kill the victim. They've exercised their power to do it. They're, and we can analyze the fact that they exercise this power effectively uh, in virtue of the fact that they caused the outcome. And we can see this because they were both necessary and sufficient for the outcome. But sufficiency is clearly not necessary because you can imagine a case, this is the two small assassins, where both of them, uh, sorry, uh, let me see, the two small assassins is a case where um, neither of them, of them is strong enough to push the car over the cliff, but each of them is necessary, right? Neither of them is sufficient. They need each other to do it. They have to exercise power with each other in order to affect the outcome. And they have that power with each other to be able to do it, but neither of them is sufficient. So sufficiency, right? We wouldn't say that they uh, didn't cause the outcome. They played a call role, even though they weren't sufficient. Okay, well, what about necessity? Well, necessity is not necessary either. And that's what the two eager assassins are meant to demonstrate. This is where two assassins simultaneously shoot, right? And of course, if one of them hadn't shot, the outcome would have happened anyway. So they weren't necessary for the outcome. And right? that's what that's meant to show. Um, and so, but nevertheless, they played a causal role in the outcome, assuming, you know, that they shot exactly the same time and et cetera, et cetera, right? We have to sort of make certain assumptions about the details. Um, but uh, what I am keen to argue is that even uh, neither necessity nor sufficiency is necessary to have played a causal role in the outcome. And that's what the three small assassins is meant to show. So you have a victim who's tied up in the, in the car, you have to have at least three people to push. You know, it's such a heavy car, or at least the assassins are so small, they, they need three of them. Uh, but, uh, um, sorry, you need to have at least two, right? You need to have at least two, but there's three of them and all three of them push. So neither of them is necessary. None of, neither of them, none of them is uh, sufficient. And yet it looks as if intuitively, all three of them play a role in causing the outcome and that they have the power together to exercise that, uh, that, that role. So, so ex ante, they have the power to do it, and ex post, they efficaciously exercised that power uh, and affected the killing of the victim, all three of them together, even though only two of them were necessary. And none of them were, uh, none of the individual actions were, of course, sufficient for it because they needed each other. So that's what I'm, what I try and argue is to say uh, that that's what I'm trying to show here is to say that uh, the exercise of agential causal power does not have to be a kind of causation that is necessary or decisive for the outcome. That's, so that's sort of you know, a kind of way of addressing this problem of many hands. It's a way of uh, addressing the, prob the inefficacy problem in debates about ethics, say about the ecology, uh, in animal ethics, and so on. So these are, uh, however, for those of you thinking normatively, um, I think that normative responsibility should be attributed not to the causal role that you play, but to the power that you have. Uh, so there's a kind of, there, there's a kind of, uh, um, I haven't really, you know, worked out this view in detail, but that's sort of my, where, I, where I'm coming from. I think really what we need to focus is on what kind of power do people have and what kind of power do they exercise? Because sometimes people exercise their power without causing the outcome and they exercise it efficaciously. So that's what I want to turn to next. 
Um, actually, no, that's not what I want to turn to next. I want to turn to the welcome test next. I will get to that after I talk about the welcome test. Okay, so it's agential in that the agent's role in affecting the outcomes operates by way of their intentional actions, and it's causal in that the agent affects outcomes by playing a causal role, even if they don't make a difference to the outcome. Now, so that's the intentional action test and the causation test. Now, what about the welcome test in this case? Well, causal efficacy, as I said, is not sufficient. You also have to satisfy the welcome test. Um, but for agential power, right, there has to be a sense in which you favor the outcome. That's one way to put this. But for agential power, favoring also has to be linked to the exercise of intentional agency. That's just what I take the notion of agential power to be, that it's linked to the exercise of uh, uh, your intentional agency. Um, and you exercise agency by way of your intentional actions, which themselves are constituted by your intention in action. And so the fact that you wield, that you exercise agential power by way of your intentional actions is the basis for and the justification for the intentional action test. The fact that your intentional actions are constituted by intentional states, your intention in action, is what justifies um, this uh, other part, which is the welcome test in a particular form, which is not only that must you favor the outcome, but also that that favoring attitude that you have should somehow be linked to your intention in action. In other words, linked to the actual exercise of agency when you are exercising your power. And so one obvious way in which your favoring attitude could be linked to your intentional agency is if it just is your intention in action. So if you intend the outcomes, you favor it, and that favoring just consists in the fact that you intended the outcomes. And so certainly that's a case where if the outcome was intended by you and you undertook your action to effect it and you successfully did, that's a case of exercising your intentional agency and affecting the outcome. That's a successful case of the exercise of power. However, unlike many other uh, uh, um, theorists of power, I wanna say that intending the outcomes is not necessary. There's other ways of satisfying the welcome test for, for uh, agential power that don't amount to that very strong link and so that's what the um, uh, point of these other examples like the predatory movie mogul and the devout tyrant is. They're meant to show you other ways in which um, you can uh, um, favor the outcome and that favoring of yours can be appropriately linked to your intention in action in a way that satisfies the welcome test that is appropriate for the exercise of intentional, uh, of agential power. Um, so whether I go through the cases is kind of kind of depend on how much time I have left. Where what? Uh, how, how many minutes have I been speaking for? Ten minutes. Okay. So, sorry. You don't think I should leave out the predatory movie mogul? Well, you all know who I'm talking about when I'm talking about the predatory movie mogul, and the example is meant to be a case where you have somebody who didn't necessarily intend uh, the one outcome that they intended was the, you know, the sexual predation part of it. That's what they intended, but they didn't necessarily intend to also have as a kind of another effect of their actions to get kind of subservience on the movie set. Um, and, uh, but they welcome, they, they favor it. Okay, is that favoring appropriately linked to their intention when they were acting? Well, it could be if um, their favoring attitude towards that subservience is uh, explained by an attitude that itself is instantiated in the uh, in, uh, 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 intention in action when they were uh, raping. That's the that's the uh, that's what that example is meant to show. And I, I, I take it that everybody is clear about who I'm talking about. Um, well, there's one person in particular that really inspired this example. Yes, uh, I can, you can imagine who it is. Um, Okay, so, but what, part, of the, part of the idea here is that sometimes uh, people exercise their uh, agential power uh, without actually in, uh, having in view, without intending the extrinsic outcomes of their actions. Many times they uh, are just actually interested in the intrinsic outcome, which is the fact that they acted and that they're producing the outcomes, whatever they may be. So for example, think of bureaucrats, you know, I'm operating by the rules and I want whatever outcomes happen to to be affected in virtue of the fact that I'm going by the correct procedures. And whatever they may be, I don't have a view one way. Maybe I disfavor some of those outcomes, but nevertheless, I favor the fact that it's through my 
exercise of bureaucratic power following these rules that they be produced. That's what I really think. So that's, uh, I think that's an example of the exercise of uh, agential power, even though the particular outcomes, the extrinsic outcomes are not intended by the agent. So um, what I wanna do next is to just uh, give you a sense of what I'm talking about when I talk about agential non-causal power. Um, well, how can it be the case that you exercise power to effect outcomes uh, efficaciously without having caused them? Well, that's because it may be the case that you simply, and this is the language I use, that you ensure or you see to it that the outcome uh, obtains. How might that be? Well, you might be someone who um, is, uh, who's, you act, and then you're, the causal process that you set into play is preempted by something. So it doesn't go to its full effect. It go, it, you, know, you, you start a causal process, but that causal process is cut short by another causal process that produces the outcome itself before yours goes to completion, right? So what are you doing there? You're making sure that if that other thing didn't you know, appear midway through, you're making sure that it would have happened anyways. You're seeing to it, you're ensuring that it happened. Sometimes you do this, and this takes the form of invigilation, where you're kind of hovering, if you're like, you're poised, you're in, you're, you've, you've adopted a kind of conditional intention. You're watching the person to see, are they going to carry it out and make sure, are they gonna do it? And you're there ready to act if they don't. And then they do it, but you were ready behind them to ensure that it happened. you were invigilating them this way. Uh, but there, the fact that they did it kind of preempted your uh, action. And so you forbear from acting. But nevertheless, you had already acted in the relevant sense because you had adopted this conditional intention. Um, it's just that, right, one of, the, one of the conditions that would have led to you to, for example, pulling the trigger didn't arise. And so you carry through with your action by forbearing. But you were, you know, you were, this is all intentional, right? That's the, that's the point. So you don't cause the outcome. And I give you an example, you know, the invigilating rainmaker and so on. But nevertheless, you're exercising your power because you're seeing to it. You're making sure that it happens. And of course, right, this is an important form of the exercise of political power, because if you have state agents invigilating you, for example, well, I think I, at least I have a very strong intuition and I think a considered judgment about this, that uh, state agents are exercising power over me, even though they don't cause the outcomes and I cause them, right? I cause the outcome, but they're making sure that it happens in case I sort of waver, right? That's the thought here. Um, Okay, so that's agential non-causal power. Now I wanna to move to the second category, the second large category of power, elicitory uh, power, of course, structural power. And that's the example that I give of the mafia godfather. Here I'm thinking about causal. Five minutes left, thank you. Here I'm thinking about causal, the causal case. The case of the mafia godfather was somebody who affected the outcomes not by way of their intentional actions, um, but uh, it passes the causal test. Why? Because it's some feature of the mafia godfather that actually helps to cause the outcomes. For example, the godfather's position in the hierarchy of the, of, of the, uh, of the mafia organization itself, or the, ma uh, the uh, mafia godfather's position, not just in the hierarchy internally, but also in relation to other uh, mobsters, right? So that, that can also play a very important role in the in, in the power that he wields over, for example, his henchmen, and also to affect the outcomes that he's able to affect without uh, lifting a finger. There's also the case of the capitalist giant, right? So this is, a, this is something that, for example, uh, social democratic left-wing uh, parties that come into power often face in capitalist economies where they come into power, they wanna affect a series of, of laws, and then all of a sudden you have capital flight or the threat of capital flight, and so they just don't do it because they know it would be a disaster. Okay, um, so that's, that's meant to be uh, illustrations of elicitory structural causal power. And so once, so this is the kind of form of the argument in the paper, once, if you've come on board so far, which is to say that you say, yeah, okay, I can see that there's this thing called non-causal agential power. And then I can see there's this other thing, which is passive elicitory structural power, which takes causal form. Then, it seems to me, uh, part of my, my, my hope is that I've dislodged your intuitions enough from the initial, if you like, liberal starting point um, 
to now introduce to you this idea of structural non-causal power, which is meant to be illustrated by the case of the immobile little capitalist. This is where you elicit outcomes neither by way of your intentional actions nor by having any, uh, any feature of you playing any causal role in the outcome. So this is uh, where the outcome is welcome to you. The immobile little capitalist, for example, occupies a position in the economic structure uh, such that uh, low taxes are extremely welcome to it uh, because it helps to maximize profits. But the threat of capital flight comes from the other little capitalists who are mobile. It's just that this one happens to be immobile. They all occupy the same position in the capitalist economic structure. They maybe occupy a different position in the family structure, but in the capitalist economic structure, they occupy the same position. And so they're able to all get the outcome that they want. It's just that this immobile little capitalist doesn't play any causal role in it. Um, so that is meant to be an example of um, elicitory structural, but non-causal power. And so let me say one, one thing that sort of ends this uh, talk is that uh, it's important for me to recognize this as a form of power. Often people talk about this kind of structural power, I think, and as well as the causal, ver causal version of it too, both the causal and the non-causal version of structural power. Often people talk in terms of privilege and um, talk about the privilege that people have and so on, the benefits they get thanks to their privilege and virtue of occupying the social structure, position in social structure and so on. I think it's important to recognize these examples of privilege as uh, instances of a broader phenomenon. They are species of power, why? Because First of all, in the normative vocabulary that we use, I think it's important to recognize it as an instance of power because of what I want to do in uh, theories of justice, the dem democratic theory in um, accounts of responsibility and so on. But also because I think that um, uh, privilege has connotations that um, uh, are specific. They have connotations of hierarchy. They have connotations of lack of reciprocity of concentration, whereas structural power does not have to take this form. Structural power can be widely distributed. It doesn't necessarily have to be hierarchical. Uh, in fact, some forms of structural power like this are highly welcome, uh, I would say, even on an egalitarian conception. So that's why I think it's a species of a larger phenomenon that we should recognize. Um, so I think I'm gonna end there. Uh, you want me to talk about that too? Okay, sure. I will talk as long as you want me to keep talking. <laughs> so I think that there's complications. So this is uh, the, the feminist scientist is meant to illustrate a complication. Um, there's complications because sometimes, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm open to rethinking this. However, you know, I, I don't have, a, I don't, I'm not settled in my views about these things, but the way that I see it is that whether or not something is welcome to you is going to often depend on which aspect of the social structure we focus on and which aspect of your intentions or your preferences, uh, uh, your intentional attitudes in general, we're focusing on. And there's always this problem when we're talking about uh, intentional states, of, there's a kind of description, generalization versus particularization problem. So we can uh, describe the same set of actions uh, with intentions that are described much more generally or more particularly. So for example, in the case of feminist scientists, yes, there's a sense in which the scientist welcomes the outcome, which is gets the job, uh, but there's a sense in which the scientist doesn't welcome the outcome because they didn't want to get the job by way of the biases that exist in the labor market, for example, the gender biases that exist. Okay, so that's, so it depends on how we're abstracting, what, what level of generalization and some, so the only thing I, 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 and this is relevant for the welcome test, relevant for figuring out whether the person has structural power or not. And it seems to me that the most could, that could be said, at least this is the most that I've been able to come up with saying, so maybe you have other ideas about this, is that there's no uh, kind of objective fact of the matter, that this is, uh, that in fact, there's, there's ambivalent, uh, there's, there, there's ambivalence in the nature of the case about whether this is, an, this is an instance of the uh, of, of wielding structural power or not. So that's sort of, um, uh, but I have a feeling that this is under theorized. So I'm open to a lot of pushback on this. So maybe I'll end there. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, that was great.
So uh, people who are on Zoom, if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand uh, using the raise hand function. And then uh, Patricia here will, will monitor that and we welcome your interventions. Uh, and if anyone here would like to start. It's been very fascinating uh, talk. So I wanted to ask you whether, do we have to have some situations that uh, we're gonna have agential power and at the same time structural power? I'm thinking about Putin, for instance. And also, um, sorry, because I was not able to read your paper, so I was trying to read all, it's, it's a lot. Um, so how do we translate this, your theory, which to me is fascinating into day-to-day -day life, which can, or what could be the consequences? Um, I'm thinking about political power, international relations, criminal law, for instance, uh, I'm from Spain and I'm a visiting scholar here, and the theory of intention is so important in, in criminal law. So I just wanted, if you could, maybe like also like explore some um, cases or uh, as you see that your theory can can make some impact, you know. Um, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. What, what is your name? Uh, my name is Leah. I'm Leah. a visiting scholar okay. from Spain. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, uh, uh, you know, as I said, my own motivation about the cases that led me to think about power were in democratic theory. So that's, I think, the best that I can. I don't want to wade into areas that you know, I, I don't have uh, expertise in and I can't really speak to very intelligently. Um, so I, I want to just stick to what I feel more confident about. Um, and the cases that I have in mind are, like I said at the beginning, uh, an analysis of power like this. Um, I think helps to shed light on how it is that, uh, what it means to talk about political equality. If political equality is in part involves equal power in decision-making, to me, that's an instance of agential power. So democratic theory, I take it is about in part the equal distribution of agential power amongst agents. Um, and then the question is, what does that mean? In uh, how do you institutionally articulate that? And Part of what I think that it means is recognizing the way that individuals can exercise power with each other. So the argument that I was giving, for example, about why necessity in the case of ca agential causal power, necessity for the outcome, in other words, being able to make a difference to the outcome is not actually the criterion for figuring out whether you have efficaciously exercised power or not. Why? Because agents exercise power with each other and they're able to, as collectivities, to effect outcomes. And it's not just that the collectivity as a whole has collective power, although that's true, but it's also that the individuals who are members of that collectivity individually have power that they wield with their fellow members of that collective. And that's what democratic theory is concerned with in part is with the unequal distribution of power amongst individuals. So that's like a concrete example that I kind of uh, motivated me, although I'm quite aware that I think this kind of theory has implications for areas that I don't work on. And so my hope is that other people might find this useful. And if they have ways that you think that, you know, uh, that this could apply to that this could apply to or that would require refinement of theory, because I haven't thought about those cases, then then I'd be more than happy to hear about. Them. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I thought it was great. Uh, and I had a question about the immobile little capitalist uh, case. Um, so I just wanted to get clear on exactly what my intuition is supposed to be uh, in that case. Am I supposed to think that the immobile little capitalist is exercising power in that case? Um, because I'm a bit reluctant to say that because they're not doing anything, right? That they're, they're, it's hard to say that they're exercising power. If I mean, maybe I, I might be prepared to say that like they have power or, or, or a slightly different intuition uh, and would something like that do for you? Or, or do I have to think that exercising power is what's going on in this case for your argument? For this? So I avoid calling that a case of exercising power because I think we have very strong linguistic intuitions about the term exercising. And that's exactly why I reserve the term exercising for agential power. And this is not a case of agential power. And so when we talk about exercising power, I reserve that for when you affect outcomes by way of your intentional actions. So that's agential power. So yes, I would not describe this as a case of exercising political power. However, in the case of this passive or elicitory, and in this particular case, structural form of power, where it's not by way of your intentional actions, and so it's not by way of exercising your agency, um, 
I agree with you. It's a case where you have power, right? However, what I need is I need a verb to be able to describe the, the, the distinguishing case about intentional, uh, the, the, the power of intentional agents, right? Uh, that I need is to distinguish the case where you satisfy the welcome test or you don't. So you might have structural power, but you're not, and then plug in your verb, right? You're not using it, whatever it is. You're not blank for now. Uh, if the outcomes are not welcome to you. You are, plug in your verb, if the outcomes are welcome to you, because why? Because you're accomplishing your uh, intentions in some way. You're accomplishing your objectives. You're, 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 you're satisfying your preferences, whatever it is, but in this passive sense. So the word that I use that is meant to be indifferent between the active and the passive is wielding power. And I know that that's not wholly satisfying. And that's why I say, I'm not trying to appeal to your linguistic intuitions about um, the word wielding. I'm trying to appeal to your judgment about this case being a case of power, which I think you're recognizing is. You say, I'm happy to say this is a case where you have power. And now I want to say to you, look, but there's a difference between this case and another case where you might have power, but the outcomes are not what you want, right? It doesn't satisfy the welcome test. That's, that's, that's something. So take the example of, the feminist scientist, there's, there's, a part, there's something about the outcome that the feminist scientist does not welcome, right? And that's relevant in our judgment about whether or not the individual, now to use the language that I'm using, they've wielded power or not. And I realize that the verb wielding is not wholly satisfactory either because of the mixed linguistic intuitions about it. But whatever it is, like, you know, I don't want to invent an English word, but that's what I want, is I, I want to be able to say that this is a case where it's not just that the agent has power and that this is just some kind of, uh, if you like, uh, this is some kind of effect that is unrelated to the agent's intentional states, right? It is related to the agent's intentional states. It's welcome to the agent. And they get something in virtue of having occupied this position in the social structure. And what I want to say is thanks to their power. And it's not just some kind of like, you know, uh, Power effect is how some people talk, talk about things. There's, there, there are power effects, but you know, they can be wholly unwelcome. This one is welcome. And that's, that's why it falls under the purview of what I'm trying to capture in the core concept of wielding power. So that's the verb I'm using. I see. Thanks very much. So yeah, this is one. I'm not a political theorist. I really appreciated the uh, parsimonial way in which you put up these examples and they were very uh, easy to understand, and I also appreciate that you didn't use formulas of game theory type. Uh, so yeah, that was great. I I have actually three questions. Um, you can answer whichever you think uh, is more interesting, or uh, the one that you have the capacity to do. Um, so first is: Does structural power carry the assumption of interdependency? Um, and I, I'm thinking here of what you said in the end, where uh, collective action changes the structures. Um, but I think in, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, of it in a way in which that agent that is able to have the most significant connections with others uh, is the one that is able to live a coalition to get there and that gives that agent structural power. So I wonder if that's a way in which uh, you can conceive uh, structural power. Uh, and the other question is whether the structural power, of course, can generate unwelcoming results. And I think uh, in the phrase of Foucault that uh, every power creates a reaction. So let's think of it as uh, international politics. The United States uh, has a counter reaction from non liberal uh, states uh, or coalitions of non liberal states. But the fact that they generate this reaction, and the stronger the reaction it is, it implies that the US has a lot of structural power because that's a response to their structural power. I, I don't know if I'm making it 
clear. So I, I, I wonder if those two instances that I mentioned are uh, instances of structural power in your view. I'm not exactly sure whether I got, I got the, the, the last example that you were giving, but is it that um, you have in mind where uh, because of the social structures that exist, so I just wanna, let me just clarify one thing. So again, sometimes people use the term structural power just to mean the power that you have in virtue of the position that you occupy in a social structure. And that's not sufficient for my sense of the term because I wanna save it for when it is passive, which is to say where you don't have to, we also, you don't do anything. So if you're thinking about the case where it's just that, you know, the, the US, for example, occupies a position in the structure, in the interstate structure, and that that is itself what provokes others to respond in certain ways, then yes, that's just them occupying. They don't have to do anything. And that sort of, you know, uh, out of, for example, one way this operates is through um, anticipated reactions, right? Like they think, okay, well, they occupy this position. They're so powerful. We have to be careful what we do because we know that they are disposed to, right? They don't even, they may, may have not even, you know, as a collective agent, the U.S., whatever, you know, the, the state hasn't formed any intentions about what they're going to do uh, if we do X, Y, or Z. But we know that they're disposed to do this because we know something about their history. And so we have to be careful. Yes, that would be an example of structural power uh, being wielded by the U.S. In my, as, as I understand it. Now, I'm not, I'm not, does that speak to the example you have? Yeah, that's what you're, okay, good. Um, and in terms of relationships, I mean, the, the interdependence between people. Yes, I do think that, again, if I'm understanding your question properly, um, I do think that the kinds of relationships that you have with others can be the basis for your power, basis for your social power. So the fact that, for example, you've been socialized in the same way as others, and that you have these relationships with them in virtue of that common socialization that enable you to overcome collective action problems, which enable you to act together as a group in a way that another group that didn't have these relationships, didn't have social capital and so on, would not have been able to solve the collective action problems to act as a group means that you have more power as an individual. Why? Because part of your power, individual power, comes from the fact that you're a member of a group with collective power. So yes, relationships can certainly be the basis of your agential power, for example. So my question is somewhat of a follow-up, I think, to, I think it was Callum who asked it originally about the um, petite capitalists and all of that kind of example. And I wondered if there was any relevance to uh, this difference between them and kind of the larger capitalist structure that by moving can actually influence kind of the well-being of the community that they're leaving in the sense that it seems like the, the petite capitalist is gaining their ability to get what they want in virtue of having interests that happen to align with the larger capitalist organization and if those interests diverge it seems like suddenly the smaller capitalist no longer gets to enact what they want. They don't get the outcomes they want. And so it seems like there's maybe some sort of difference between having and benefiting from power going on there. And I'm wondering if that's kind of a difference that you'd be interested in talking about or whether it's real or something that you can kind of explain more in your own terms. So that's all. Good, thank you. Um, so the. Uh, the, I mean, I think the way that you introduced the example is slightly different than the way that I was thinking about it. And so I wonder if, um, I, I would be curious to hear what you would say about the way, the example that I had in mind, which is not that uh, the immobile little capitalists, uh, the, the welcome outcomes uh, are caused by some larger capitalists, but that they are caused by other little capitalists, just like this one, who occupy exactly the same position in the social structure as this one. It's just that those ones, for example, don't have, uh, let's say, family responsibilities that keeps them immobile, that they are mobile. That's why the state anticipates their capital flight. Um, so you were thinking about it more like the small assassins case than, than as something distinct from that. 
where like, because it, it seems as if the small capitalists in this case are gaining power collectively. And then one who does not have the power is kind sure, of gaining sure. it. Yeah, what, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that sounds that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. that sounds okay. good. But it's, um, yeah, it's still, but it's, still the, it's still the case that the immobile little capitalist plays no causal role in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, but I guess so. My question though then would just shift a little bit to to the case where if the mobile versus immobile capitalists their interests diverge. Right, the immobile one suddenly loses their ability to realize the things they want, right? So I'm wondering if their lack of causal ability in that case is relating them to the outcomes slightly differently than the people whose causal powers can bring about those outcomes in any important way uh, that relates to ascribing them power versus something next to power but not identical with it or something, I don't know. I'm not terribly invested in it, I'm just curious. So. Yeah, uh, I would be open to that, yes. Um, I mean, there's a formal way in which it is different in the conceptual architecture that I'm thinking, which is one is that it is causal mm -hmm. and the other that it's not. And then I think what you're suggesting is, okay, and that difference makes a difference for other things. And I'd be open to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and it certainly might play a different. So it might cash out differently when we think about the normative theory that you want to plug in to uh, think about what responsibility actors have and so on. Yes. Great, thank you very much. So I really, I think I followed most of what you were trying to say. And I'm curious about some of the implications with the feminist scientist. Um, so I'm thinking, because one of the things that you're sort of bringing out in that example, um, I under, as I understand it, is that the feminist scientist occupies a position um, in the structure but they don't welcome what they get out of that position, in this case, being hired. And you want to say that that's an ambivalent case, that it's not clear whether they're wielding or blank verb power. Um, but I think that that example sort of kind of points the way to ways in which you might, we might still want to say that that feminist scientist has power or maybe this is where the verb is necessary, like filling in that blank, has power um, regardless of whether they welcome it. And why? Because mm -hmm. if that happened to other members of their social group, they would welcome it. So it doesn't really matter that that individual doesn't welcome it. Um, it matters that maybe the majority or a substantial proportion of people in, who share that position in the structure welcome it. So I'm just pushing, I guess, on the welcome condition and if you can say a little bit more about how that diverges from the individual how that relates to the others and i guess it's like pushing on the individualism of the view good more broadly. good no that's great so um i, I want to hear more about what what you're what the what you just last the last thing that you said about how it's pushing on the individualism but in, but for the first part of what you were saying i think you're absolutely right because the welcome test is not supposed to be a test for whether you have power or not it's supposed to be a test for whether you wielded the power that you have. That's the, that's what it's supposed to show. So, for example, like I mean, to take the 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 mugger case, right? Um, if it's not it's certainly the person who's walking in the back alley has the power to get themselves mugged, and they might even exercise that power. And the 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 example that I try, you know that, that I give you there is well, imagine that they were an undercover police officer trying to smoke out, you know the muggers in the back alleys and they're posing as like a, you know, a hapless figure walking through the back alley, right? So they have the power and they might be wielding it. But in that case, they didn't because it wasn't welcome. So the, the, the welcome test is just about whether they wielded the power or not, not whether they have it. So the feminist scientist has the power. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's, I guess that's the clarification. And that, that, that kind of, in a way, goes back to Callum's question, I think, right? That's what the welcome test is. That's why it's important for me to have that verb that distinguishes the have versus the wielded is because that's the verb that's tracking the welcome test. Okay, the, I understand. In these cases, yeah. I just want to clarify. So, but it wouldn't be the case that the feminist scientist uh, welcomes it uh, only or wields it only if they take the job, but not if they don't take the job. Right. That can't be what you mean. Just clarify a little more. 
So the taking the job part is, is I, th- I don't know, I can't, I'll have to go back to the example The taking the job part is a, is a different outcome. The, the, the outcome that I was interested in is where they were, they were, I don't know, maybe I didn't put it this way, but the outcome, what I should have said is whether they were offered the job. So that they were offered the job uh, is, didn't require any action on their part. This is why it's meant to be a case of um, elicitory power, structural power. Um, so whether they welcome it or not is relevant for, for whether they've wielded their power, even though the wielding in question here is a passive conception. It's not about something that they've done. Um, so I, I realize that in practice, it's hard to construct these cases because of course the scientist has done certain things. They've published papers and so on like that, right? They've done, but it's meant to be a case where, you know, you get that you're isolating the way in which uh, you receive certain kinds of benefits just in virtue of the position that you occupy right. and not thanks to these actions that you've undertaken. Yeah. Although of course, always, you know, there's always a background that you're holding for granted, you're taking for granted, where of course we've done all kinds of things that contributed to the social structures and stuff. So, okay, but then yeah. I have a question. Um, what about, um, so one is what the advantage is of this way of thinking of it, um, that is superior to or different from just uh, the power that one has in virtue of one's role. And uh, just more generally, you kind of put that aside as, I mean, although you make appeals to it, you put aside the issue of the structural power that could inhere in certain roles at the beginning. And, and in that sense, I also want to know, shouldn't what, I mean, this is a way that we often talk about structural power to the degree we talk about it is the power that inheres in your role. And what is the status of that in your view? Because it isn't merely passive. Right. So uh, just uh, what is that category? And I don't think you would want to reserve structural power for only the passive cases. And I didn't think that was entirely clear in your I see. presentation. Right. Yeah. So I do want to reserve the way that I use the word structural power for the passive case. But I do think that the power that you have in virtue of occupying a position in the social structure and that social structure may involve various kinds of social roles and so the roles that you play in a social structure that to me is just kind of a typical case of agential power that is social so you for ex- for example so it's social structural yes it's okay. in virtue of social structure so this is i mean this is why I, I try and say look you know there are different ways of using this term one way that people use the term structural power is to talk about the power that people have just in virtue of the positions they occupy, including the roles that they play in these structures and so on. And that, I, that that's fine. That's one way you can use the term structural power. Um, I think that there is something distinct. Uh, in some ways, I think almost all examples of agential power, almost all examples of power, when you're in a social context, are structural in that broad sense of the term. Right. So if you want to call all kind, you know, all social power structural, that's fine. But what I'm trying to do is say, look, there's this other phenomenon that is not all examples of social power that has to do with where you're able to elicit outcomes, uh, but not through anything that you're doing. But in virtue of the position that you occupy in social structures. So my my I'm using the term in a more restricted way, but that in no way denies the importance of what I would call uh, social power. Um, well, but it's also importantly structural because it has to do with the uh, with the you know roles that are defined yes. and not merely yes, it is structural. general collective social power, for example. So yes. I would I would just would have been clearer if if it had been a division within structural power to to specify this kind that is often unobserved. Uh, not to, you know, just redefine the term completely. But anyway, that's... Yeah, I see. I see the and the other issue, just one more little thing. Uh, what about the standard case where uh, people may not welcome the uh, consequences? I mean, you have the one case of the feminist scientist, but um, it also seems to me rather more common that you have people occupying these exploitative roles First of all, they not, may not be fully aware of the exploitative aspect of it, but even to the to the degree that they are aware of it, they may not welcome it 
they may be very unhappy uh, about that description of it. So I'm just wondering how much self-consciousness does one have to have uh, for welcoming? In some parts of the paper, it almost seems as you define it, sort of by definition, the prime minister welcomes it because they're because they're attached to their prime ministerhood or something. Mm -hmm. That seemed a little bit, you know, no. So it might, it might be the case that um, there are outcomes. And so this is, and maybe this speaks to the question uh, that Aaron was asking too, in some ways. Um, there are cases in which you might be benefiting from uh, certain consequences. There's outcomes that benefit you in some way. Um, in the sense that it serves the interests that you have in virtue of say occupying a certain position in the social structure, but that these are not welcome to you because you are alienated from that you, you know, you're alienated from the position that you occupy in that structure. And so it doesn't properly link up to your agency. And because I'm interested in the uh, power, both in the, in the agential and in the elicitory cases, I'm interested in power in this sense of power of intentional agents, um, then it is not a case. It, it would be a case of benefiting in this sense of it benefits your, it serves your interests, but there isn't any proper link to your intentional states. Um, so it's not welcome to you. If it fails the welcome test, and the welcome test is not about somebody's account of your objective interests or the interest that can be imputed to you in virtue of the position that you occupy in the social structure, it has to properly link up to your intentional states in some way. Um, and if you can't tell a story about how it links up, then you would have a case that I think Aaron was asking for, which is where you're benefiting in one sense, but it doesn't satisfy the welcome test uh, for it to be a case of power. That's how yeah, I would but I'm not, I mean, a lot of the most difficult cases are cases where people wouldn't acknowledge or don't acknowledge their role within, um, within the structure and the power that they have in the structure. And they, so welcoming, I think just, it isn't clear to me um, what you mean by that exactly. So are you you're thinking of cases where, for example, uh, it serves objectives of mine, um, but it does so in a way that isn't clear to me. And that I would, yeah. And that I'm not, that yeah. So yeah, I think in order to really flesh out the account, um, it, you know, so one thing that I have in mind is something can satisfy the welcome test insofar as it is, um, a means towards satisfying some of your preferences, even if you're not aware that this is the means to satisfying okay, your preferences. Okay, who's deciding about the preferences though? Uh, or well, this the is preferences just, you are would the acknowledge you it, is there something hypothetical about this that you would acknowledge it as your preference? If you, I mean, thinking of the capitalist or even a cog in the machine type case or, you know, I mean, the capitalist case, like, uh, um, nice capitalist who is exploiting and isn't aware of their that it's satisfying their preferences they feel they have to because because they have to make money or or just they feel that you know i just don't know about welcoming and yeah, who, yeah. okay yeah no i i i i think uh i think these are uh and it's especially important yeah, if you want to I spell agree. out the normative side. Yeah. I'm very interested in the part that you yeah, yeah, yeah. put at the very end of the paper. Maybe that'll be part two. Yeah. No, I agree. These are, good, the these are good questions. Uh, implications. Okay. We have a question from Alessio. Yeah. Thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, I was just wondering, I know it is a very general and hard question. What would be, in your view, the relationship between power and moral responsibility? Because I have like, I think it is a common intuition when that when an agent exerts an intentional causal power in producing some outcome, it is re reasonable to hold her or him uh, respons morally responsible for what she or he have done. But I was thinking about the case in which uh, an agent exerts an elicitory power 
Uh, in that case, would you claim that he or she is morally responsible for what uh, she has done? Or because I have the feeling that even if even in the little capitalist and capitalist giant examples, uh, the people in the cases could foresee the consequences, at least a part of the consequences of their actions. And why one might say that we can hold them re responsible for what they have done, at least in a very lower degree of moral responsibility. What do you think about it? No, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So I don't have a theory that can answer that because I don't have a theory of moral responsibility to sort of add to what I'm saying here. So I don't have a worked out view, but I have kind of intuitions that are in line with yours, which is to say that, yes, I mean, part of the reason why I want to get this right is because I think that it will serve a normative theory and that responsibility can accrue to uh, the elicitory forms of power that agents have. So I, that's kind of, you know, that, I mean, if you want, like I have a kind of Spider-Man view of, of things, which is that with power comes responsibility, but I don't have a theory about it that I could give you. Thank you very much. This was really exciting. Uh, this is my first time ever attending the colloquium here. I'm a health economist. I'm not a philosopher or a political theorist, but my question is really, clar you know, to clarify. So is, are you saying that the classification of uh, power as structural or agential is contingent upon the desirability of the outcomes in such a way that certain outcomes um, and the maybe the chain from intention to the outcomes would determine that the nature of that power versus other in other situation you know other outcomes might um result in a different classification of the same action so i wouldn't put it in terms of desirability because that seems like a normative concept but i would put it in terms of you're talking about the welcome test, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah, I would put it in terms of whether it's favored, whether yes. not not whether it's you know something to favor, but whether it is favored. It is um, favored by the by the agent. By the agent. Yes. So that's normative, isn't it? No, it's a descriptive thing about the person. They have a preference for it. They have uh, they have objectives that it would fulfill. It has they're intending to produce it and so on. There is it's not a question of whether they're right. In, having that preference, whether they, you know, should intend this and so on. So it's not, it's not normative in that sense, but it's, um, it's supposed to be, yeah, I, I don't want a moralized conception of power is, is, uh, is maybe the, but I, I'm not sure I'm in answering your question. Yeah, it's, I'm just trying to, because the welcome test seems to be a critical part of understanding the distinction between structural and agential. And I'm, I'm not clear on if, if you have the same, I'm thinking about, you know, the example of a dictator, for example, where by, by virtue of their presence and acting like a mafia godfather in some sense, people, you know, are, you know, are rounded up and jailed. Uh, that's the, the outcome could be considered, the jailing of people could be considered an outcome, but in this case, perhaps it's, it's the domination that that agent has could also, could, you know, could be the outcome. In that particular case, if domination is the outcome, then this is a type of agential power. Um, if jailing is the outcome, then that's perhaps structural power. Uh, and then what's the implication of the distinction between structural and agential? You know, what, one, one implication I, I thought I heard in the discussion is maybe the normative implications, but I'm not sure if there are others. Yeah, it could be, but one—I mean, what one thing that I would say is that you're right that the welcome test is different in the case of agential power and structural power on my account because, in the case of structural power, the welcome test is weaker. So, in the case of agential power, there's two parts to the welcome test. One is that you favor the outcome. And the second is that that favoring attitude of yours has to be properly linked to your intention and action. And that second part is missing necessarily in the case of structural power because there is no intentional action. And so there's no intention in action for it to be linked up to. 
So it's a weaker test. You're right. So it's not that one of them has a welcome test and the other doesn't. Both of them have the welcome test. It's just that it takes a weaker form in the case of structural power. Hi, um, thanks so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so my question is, what do you think about um, structural power and autonomy? And I'm not sure how exactly just clarify the kind, the idea of autonomy that I have in mind, but uh, it seems that at least in the case of a gentle power, there's a, I have an intu intu intuition that if someone has a gentle power, that they have a choice to not wield it. Um, so for example, in the assassin case, they, the assassin could have not pulled the trigger right. and would still have that power. Um, but as you said, there, there's no, you can't use wield or exercise in the case of structural power, the word, because um, it's not quite, it doesn't quite fit that context. I think that's what sort of what you said. So I can't put the idea of autonomy in the case of structural power in terms of sort of the freedom to wield the structural power because it doesn't quite make sense. So I don't know how to put that notion. And but but putting that aside, I'm I'm not sure if uh, look, so. Uh, I wonder if you think I would be right in saying that the immobile little capitalist wouldn't have autonomy in, in that case because they wouldn't have any choice to accept or not accept or I, to persuade the government in giving them a lower interest rate, uh, tax rate. Yeah, I think I see the, I see the question. So um, just, just one little quibble is that, uh, unfor I mean, I do use the word wield in the case of structural, but that was but with recognizing that, you know, it's not as there's ambivalent intuitions about that term, but, but yes, you're right. Um, so I don't think that this, uh, the analysis that you're giving us requires pulling out the heavy artillery of autonomy, because I think the notion of agency is sufficient for describing what you're describing, namely that when you're an agent, and you exercise your agency, you are exercising your choice about which action to undertake. And that's precisely what it is to exercise your agency is that you have a ch choice between acting this way or acting that way and you exercise it when you're acting intentionally. So you adopt an intention and then you act accordingly. So we don't need to talk about autonomy because I think autonomy is a much thicker, richer concept that requires a lot of other conditions to be filled. Yeah, okay. So what distinguishes agential power from structural power is, as you said, the immobile little capitalist is not exercising agency. And so it's not, a, it's not they're not doing anything. So they're not choosing anything um, in that, you know, within the background context that we're taking for granted. Of course, we can talk about the choices that the, uh, immobile little capitalist has made to end up being a capitalist. Like those are all choices that, you know, they ended up being there. So another kind of methodological thing is anytime that we're talking about power, both agential power and structural power, I think we are taking for granted a background context as fixed. Like it's not possible to talk about power um, other than against a certain background context. I just want to know what is your analysis of the capitalist agent choice? Um, is that agential or structural? As capitalist, let's say, granted. I mean, I think it's, there was a very, I mean, one of the very first questions that I didn't answer, I think, now that I think about it, is someone asked, uh, you know, can't it be the case that, you know, in virtue of occupying a certain position, that you both have and exercise a gentle power and you have and you wield structural power and the answer is yes i think that's certainly the case and so in the case of the uh, of the capitalists that you have in mind, i think the capitalist in that case uh has to be in many instances wielding exercising a gentle power because they're doing a whole bunch of things that they can only do in virtue of the position that they occupy but those outcomes depend on them doing these things and so that, for me, is an example of agential power because they're, it's by way of their intentional actions that this is happening. Um, but of course, there's also other outcomes that occur. So you know, the one that I focus on in that example uh, that uh, occur not by way of their intentional actions. So that so both both happen, and both of them are partly in virtue of the position that they occupy. And so they are social, or as you want to say, in the larger sense of structural, also structural. 
So I guess I think the thing is that substantively we agree, but I take it that you think that it's a mistake to uh, use that term in this restricted way because there's a loss. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it has to do with the notion of a structure of power and how it relates to individuals. And so I was thinking, because we have been talking about roles, you know, like what if, for instance, I'm a teacher, but at the same time, you know, I am the directing a nonprofit or a civil society organization related to environment or even at the parents association. So here, the structure of power should be like me, like holding both, or it's going to adapt and change depending on the role that I'm going to be uh, performing in in the context, or we were saying this background, you know, that we finally we need to take into consideration. So, but this is more a conceptual question. Thank so, you. So, and so what's, just tell me the question again is? Yeah, it's how you, you see uh, a structure of power, because we're thinking about, okay, what's the position you, you occupy in, in a structure in society? And, you know, I can have different positions, you know, sometimes you can have different roles in society. Yeah. So that's why I, I wanted to ask you, how do you see, the notion of a structure of power is going to be if I, I can be a teacher and I have some powers of teacher, but then I can be, I, I can leave the, <laughs> uh, the university and go to some association, you know, like with uh, neighbors yeah. or whatever. And then there I have a different role. So how is, so my power as, as it should be related to both or it's going to change depending on which context I am, I am or like which role I'm going to be performing. Um, yeah, it could be. I mean, I, I don't know that I have an analysis of like the temporal dimension of where you move in and out of various positions uh, temporally. I don't I don't think I've uh, I, I probably what I should say is that uh, the way that I've been thinking about it is very static. Um, and that obviously is limited and uh, probably misses a lot of the social reality. Um, so that's probably a limitation of the way that I've been thinking about it. But I, I, I can see why to have a richer theory, we need to have to think about the temporal dynamic. And can we think uh, the difference between agential and structural power or uh, social structural power in a way as if um, the agent has the potential to exert social power and with that potential is eliciting outcomes in others. Uh, in an example, I would say like uh, United States has the power to create coalitions and do many things, but that at the same time uh, creates outcomes without they, uh, the US. Uh, is that a way to Absolutely. make a difference? Well, that's certainly a good description of cases where um, I think that someone wields uh, elicitory structural power um, without doing anything, but it's thanks to, for example, agential power that they have. So the, there's, you know, I give you two interpretations of the Mafia Godfather case in the paper. One matches what you're talking about, which is that imagine that the Mafia Godfather the reason why the henchmen are so, you know, they do whatever it is that they want to make sure that the, you know, they fulfill the preferences and objectives of the of the Godfather, is because the Godfather has this tremendous agential power, which is that he could kill them, right? And so they anticipate that potential action of his, and so then they do all these things, even though he never does, right? He never he never exercises his agential power. And so he elicits these outcomes in virtue of having the agential power without wielding it. And so what you end up with is the wielding of uh, this kind of elicitory structural power. But that's not all the cases that are like that. So a different interpretation of the Mafia Godfather case is just where, for example, imagine actually the Godfather has no agential power, kind of weak old age right now. And the only thing that keeps him in that position is the fact that um, there's all these other gangster organizations and all the henchmen know that, you know, this godfather has this reputation and boy, their life depends on their godfather still being feared by these outsiders. 
because otherwise everything will crumble. This guy has no agential power. Right? Can't do anything. He's like in a wheelchair. Now. But in fact, right, they prop him up because they're afraid of the other social actors. So this is a way in which their social power is situated within a larger social structural context that is not dependent on the agential power of the person who has this elicitory structural power. Um, so that doesn't match the case that you have in mind, but I do think that the case you have in mind is also a very important kind of case. Okay, I'm going to abuse my power with one last question. Yes. Um, I, often the, uh, the kind of power you're talking about uh, is, some, is described in terms of the interests of the person involved, rather than their active, their preferences. And certainly in the classic Marxist analysis, it would be their interests, which is a little bit more of an objective notion than whether a person welcomes it or not. So, I mean, I'm wondering what you think about that and how, why you want to retain this idea that they have to sort of either, have, have, you know, that they would agree or somehow that it is in their, it is a preference that they have rather than interest. Right. So, um, yeah, so the two-part answer to that. One is, uh, to try and, yeah, to strongly speak against it, but then to sort of give a, a concession, which is that, um, yeah, I don't want to talk about in terms of interests because I want to talk in terms, I want to, I'm talking about the power of intentional agents, qua intentional agents. And so it's important for whatever it is, however we spell out the welcome test, this key concept of getting what you want, um, it requires linking it back to the intentional states of the actors. So that's one reason. Another reason is I don't want a moralized conception of power for various methodological reasons. Um, so that's the sort of hard kind of pushback against it. Now the, the, the concession, however, is the ambiguity that you were pointing to, which is that, um, it might be the case that you have a sort of ultimate set of objectives. You have these non-instrumental, you know, uh, telic, if you like, preferences about things. And then uh, there's these things that would serve those preferences of yours, these ultimate preferences of yours, um, but maybe you're not aware of them, right? So what about these things that instrumentally serve your ultimate preferences? Well, I think that one way to analyze uh, the Marxist case, for example, is, well, there's two things, you know, so, you know, in Marxism, we have a tradition of a kind of teleological conception about what actually is in the interests of people, emancipation, whatever, you know, whatever the term. So there's a kind of uh, view about what is, a, if you like, an objective list theory of well-being. Um, and so that's about, you know, what interests we have qua human beings, um, given the nature of these beings. But another, uh, another way of thinking about this is what interest do you have in virtue of the position that you occupy in the social structure? And that could be as a result of uh, the fact that, um, you know, you take for granted that people have these preferences. For example, they have a preference to be able to, um, within a capitalist society, to increase their income, for example. And then you think, and then you say, well, look, but if that's their preference, well, then they should uh, they should uh, want lower taxes if they occupy that position, right? Because otherwise they're not able to whatever. Um, so that's, that's an ambiguous case, right? Where it's instrumental to some set of objectives or preferences that they actually have. Um, and I'm open to that. So that's, that would be my concession. But I don't want to use the language of interest precisely because it can also be used in this other way that doesn't have any necessarily, you know, in theories of false consciousness, for example, doesn't necessarily have any link to their intentional states and so on. So, yeah. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Abizada for a fantastic talk. And thank you to those uh, who joined us on Zoom. It was great to see you. And, and thank you for the great questions and comments. Thank you. <laughs>